I'm Ian Noble and this is my in-depth analysis of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's slash Philosopher's Stone. If you're curious why there are two names, then stay tuned for this video. So I'm usually a books before movies person, but with Harry Potter, I actually have seen all the movies, unfortunately. My sister Grace was, she was watching one of the movies one time and I sat down and watched it with her and that kind of escalated uh, into watching the whole series. I, I think I might have read a little bit of the first book, but I definitely had not read the whole series before I watched the movies. That's kind of unusual for me with other series like Percy Jackson, Divergent, Hunger Games, all the John Green books. I've always been like strictly books first and then movies. I even, um, <laughs> I sat down the other day to watch um, Looking for Alaska. Apparently they made a movie and it's based on uh, the book by John Green. And I sat down turned on the TV and I was like, no, I can't do this because like, I just enjoy the book so much. And I've read it like four times. I didn't want to have the vision of like the movie actors or whatever. I, I wanted to still imagine it the way I first did when I read the book, but I, I still want to read the Harry Potter series. I'm actually on the third book now and I'm really enjoying it, even though I've seen all the movies. Uh, so this is my in-depth analysis uh, as an adult reading the Harry Potter books for the first time. So first thing, the name difference. Apparently the, the Sorcerer's Stone is the name that they, the publisher came up with when they were taking the, the book which was originally published in the UK where, where what's your face? JK Rowling, <laughs> I could have just looked here. Uh, where J.K. Rowling is from, when they went to publish it in the U.S., they actually suggested that they change the name from Philosopher to Sorcerer's Stone because they thought that children in the U.S. would not want to read a book with Philosopher in the title, because, um, I don't know, it just sounds boring, and that actually makes sense to me. So in addition to the difference between just the Sorcerer and the Philosopher's Stone, uh, there a lot of differences actually between the UK and the US releases. <laughs> Some of these I found pretty interesting. Some of them are unimportant things like car park versus parking lot or punch bag versus punching bag. I think in reference to Dudley beating up Harry. Uh, cooker versus stove. Mummy versus mommy. I, I guess that one a kid might think it's like an actual mummy like Egyptian and stuff. But then there's stuff that actually like really makes sense, like uh, fringe versus bangs, uh, jumper versus sweater, comprehensive versus public school, packet of crisps or bag of chips. I don't know, the kind of things that American kids wouldn't necessarily know if they hadn't grown up watching the best TV show ever, Top Gear, like I did. So some other interesting facts that I found while researching for this, is Harry Potter is the best-selling book series in history. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, J.K. Rowling is the world's first billionaire author, and now she claims to not be a billionaire because she gave enough money away where she doesn't have that much money, but she at least was at one point. Um, Harry Potter, the series has sold over 500 million copies. Um, and the films have grossed $7.7 .7 billion. But enough with the boring facts. In case you haven't read the series or watched the movies, if you uh, don't want any spoilers, the spoilers are about to come. Okay, so we're gonna dive right into the plot development and conflict of the book. Uh, in literature, there are six types of conflict. Man versus self, man versus man, Man versus society, man versus nature, uh, man versus machine, man versus fate or supernatural. So, uh, and it could be woman too, don't get me wrong. So the Harry Potter books are, are kind of like whodunits in disguise, at least the, the first few of them are. And 
J.K. Rowling was actually really interested in like mystery novels and they definitely influenced her as she was writing the books. But when we're trying to nail down exactly what the the main conflict of Harry Potter and the philosopher slash sorcerer's stone is, I, I think that it's a man versus man conflict uh, because it's kind of Harry, Ron, and Hermione versus Quirrell, Professor Quirrell, 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 Squirrel. Um, <laughs> it's like squirrel with no S. I just realized that. Anyway, I, I think that's more of just the central conflict because it's like who's in control of the stone, uh, kind of Harry versus, first he thinks it's Snape, but Snape is really the red herring. Oh yeah, so this kind of technique that, uh, where she like leads you to believe that there's one bad guy, but then it's another one. She actually uses that for the first two books. Uh, and this is major spoilers if you haven't read yet. But Snape is like the red herring in the first book. Uh, Cause uh, like he just acts like a jerk and does all this su suspicious stuff, which really throws you off. Unfortunately, I'd watched the movies already. So uh, I was like, kind of knowing what was going to happen but if you didn't know anything then that's what definitely gives the first book it's like mystery and kind of plot twist uh, the major plot twist and then in book two it's kind of this like who is the heir of slytherin first you think that it's malfoy who's like opening the chamber to take out all the um the muggle-born so she uses this technique in the first two books to really give a uh, kind of mystery and intrigue. But other main conflicts that are in the books are man versus society. This one I don't think is the central conflict of the, the first book, but I think it's definitely one throughout the series as kind of Harry and Ron and Hermione struggle against um, like the Ministry of Magic and what they're doing, but then also the school. I think uh, one of the big ideas of the the first book is kind of uh, the the kids doing things that are against the rules. But if like if it's right, do the ends justify the means of like breaking the rules and that sort of thing? And then there's also kind of like a class struggle uh, between wizarding families uh, like Malfoys who are rich and kind of frown upon the either poor wizarding families or the muggle-born people so there's this like struggle that kind of goes throughout the books so the third conflict that i i think is present in the first book is man versus fate or the supernatural and this one i would say it might be the overarching uh conflict for the whole series uh because voldemort is really this kind of larger than human evil devil kind of character also harry is kind of fighting against fate and these prophecies that you'll see kind of in or not prophecies i don't know if that's the right word maybe prophecies um that are kind of seen in some of the later books and like with the grim and and book three uh, so there's definitely kind of more going on supernaturally, obviously, since it's wizarding. So there's this kind of struggle between Voldemort and Dumbledore as like almost god level um, players in the the game and the story. And since Harry's kind of I don't know power wise, I wouldn't say he's below them, but he kind of starts out at a, a position under them. It's kind of reminiscent of, or I guess the opposite, since Percy Jackson came later. But it reminds me of like the Percy Jackson series where they're, they're these like gods kind of fighting each other and that sort of thing. And then you have like a demigod or kind of a less powerful being kind of doing their bidding and taking care of business. Uh, so I would say that that type of plot, the man versus fate or man versus supernatural could definitely be argued for as even the main conflict of the first book but definitely comes into play in later books because harry potter is really they're they're like the individual books as their own stories but then it's like 
the whole series and, and how you look at that. And I'm excited to kind of get into analysis of the whole series as I keep going. I'm gonna take a quick break and get some water. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about plot. And plot is made up of a few different things. It can be kind of diagrammed with the structure uh, called the Freytag's Pyramid. And it starts out with the exposition, uh, introducing the characters and setting, establishing conflict, showing how characters relate and their, their goals and motivations. Uh, then next, the rising action as tension and suspense and general interest are kind of introduced. And that all leads to the, the climax. The, the conflict is started, the main conflict the protagonist kind of starts to work towards their end goal. And next you have climax or the turning point, and that's when the protagonist decides how to resolve the conflict. Um, and it's not necessarily the most exciting part of the story, but it often is. Next you have the falling action, uh, what happens as a result of the climax. And then finally, resolution or uh, denouement, de denouement. <laughs> Um, which kind of sums up and brings the conflict to a conclusion. So in the exposition for uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's slash Philosopher's Stone, it's kind of, it's interesting because it starts out slower than probably most books that we're used to now start out. But I saw an interesting comment that if, if Harry Potter were released now, that how slow it starts wouldn't really be acceptable, but because of when it was released, people had like longer attention spans and could sit down and read all of that. Because the first chapter is really from Mr. Dursley's point of view, talking about all the strange stuff that's happening, kind of setting the scene in the muggle world. Um, and it definitely adds like an interesting um, perspective to the book and how it starts out. But I think it really now would fit better almost as an introduction. Next, the rising action. Uh, so the rising action is kind of made up of a lot of different things that happen in the first book. Um, I think it, it really starts, it starts when Harry receives letters, obviously, to go to Hogwarts because that kind of introduces that whole thing. Uh, but I think it really starts when Dumbledore mentions the the corridor uh, in his speech at the beginning of the term because that kind of like introduces this mystery of like what is uh, what's in the corridor why shouldn't kids go there then it's furthered when they end up going in the corridor when Hermione sees the trapdoor the the rising action is really it kind of turns when Harry goes to Hagrid and asks him who sold the dragon to him, which then confirms that the stranger was trying to get to the chamber wherever the stone was kept. And then he makes up his mind to, to go and get the stone because him making up his mind there is like, I don't know, really when things just start to, to turn. Okay, so for the climax or the turning point of the book, uh, I really saw it as when the three of them go into the chamber, get past the different levels, uh, and Harry finally confronts Quirrell slash Voldemort, gets the stone, takes out Quirrell. If it were like one definite moment, I would say it's like when Harry grabs Quirrell or just the whole Quirrell versus Harry scene. Yeah, but I think that whole kind of part is definitely the the top of the pyramid falling action uh when he wakes up in the hospital wing and uh finds out that Dum you find out that dumbledore had just arrived when he passed out and then when he goes to the feast where dumbledore announces the new winners of the house cup so then after the falling action or i don't know there's kind of some overlap the resolution or denouement um I would say is when Dumbledore tells Harry that he and Flamel have decided to destroy the stone, resolving the main conflict, and Gryffindor wins the House Cup, which wraps up 
kind of the subplot.